Okay, so I'm one of those preachers where if you actually talk back, it'll go better and faster. All right, so, hey, everybody. Hey, I'm so glad to be with you. I'd like to take all of my time today just to talk about Pastor Bo and Miss Amy. Is that okay with y'all? Let's just talk about them. Aren't they great? We got the pleasure of going to Israel with them a couple years ago. It's, it feels like a time warp at this point, but, but quick friends, my wife and I with them, and just couldn't be uh, more glad to be a friend of your pastor. And so it's, it's really great to kind of see the facility and see his territory a little bit. And uh, so love your pastor. I love Amy. And uh, thank y'all so much for being so good to them. They brag about y'all all, all the time. Okay, so uh, I'm Matt. I bring uh, greetings from Redemption City Church uh, right here in Fort Worth. We're, we're south on the Chisholm Trail, about 45 minutes from here, but still in the same vicinity. And so our church, we planted a couple, three years ago or so now, and we're still going. Okay, people are getting saved. We're baptizing another girl this Sunday, and so it's an, it's an amazing thing what God is doing. And so thank you all uh, for supporting the Southern Baptist Convention. We're actually, uh, you know, we're a product of your giving. So thank you for all that you're doing uh, along those lines. And so... Uh, we're, let's go ahead and get into the Word, okay? First John chapter 2, really want to dig in. My dad uh, called me a couple of months ago, and it just rang once, and it, he hung up, and I thought, well, he probably didn't mean to call me, so I'll call him back just in case, and he, so I called him back and go, hey, Dad, you mean to call me? He goes, sorry, son, I, I booty called you. I go, nope. <laughs> no, Dad, you butt dialed me. <laughs> Those two things seem similar, but there is a world of difference. Somebody tell your neighbor words matter. Okay, so let's dig into the text today. Let's not go too fast, and let's really un- try and understand what God is saying. First John chapter 2, we're going to read verses 1 to 6, and then 15 to 17, okay? My little children, John writes, I'm writing these things to you so that you only sin a little bit. <laughs> no. So that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ, the righteous, is your advocate, child of God. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. And by and by this we know that we have come to know Jesus, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says I know him but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way, in the same way that Jesus walked. Look at verse 15. Child of God, do not love the world or the things of the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, it's from the world. And the world is passing away, along with all of its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God will stand forever. Sobering words here in, in uh, 1 John 2. You ever thought about how high the bar is for us? You know, I mean, I, I, we're preaching through Philippians in my church right now. And this past Sunday, we preached about how that we are to be humble like Jesus. Literally the most humble person who's ever lived. Yeah, go and be humble like that, okay? So the title of my sermon today is, Obedience is Not a Bad Word. It's not. Obedience is getting a bad rap here in 2024. You do you. Follow your heart. Live your truth. We hear all these sorts of things. But what we find is we step toward Jesus, and as we step into our apprenticeship with him, he's trying to set us free. He's not trying to weigh us down with all these burdensome commandments that we'll never live up to. He's not trying to make us feel guilty all the time by setting the bar so high that we can never live up to the bar. That's not what he's doing. He's providing us with his easy yoke, his light burden, and we find that obedience to Jesus actually sets us free. So when John writes in verse 1 there, my little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you don't sin. He's not kidding. Okay, Uh, now he knows that we will, and hopefully less and less as we mature in Christ. So then he makes sure that we understand and know, even in that moment, as he hopes that we don't sin, he goes, but you have an advocate. So when you do, Jesus is your advocate right then and there. What a good God that he not only gives us a pathway, but he gives us himself as an advocate all the time. Again, obedience is best for you. So I got my first speeding ticket when I was 16. 
as I was leaving the movie theater after watching the original Fast and Furious. True story. Okay. I saw Dom and Brian do their thing on the streets of L.A. I was pumped up. I got on Highway 84 in Laurel, Mississippi, and I hit the ground running. And there are the red and blue lights. Is there anything more terrifying than being 16 guilty and seeing the red and blue lights? Okay. You know, John, in chapter 1 of the Gospel of John, he talks about how the law is grace. And so what felt like the worst night of my life, what felt like, you know, it's, it's never, it's never going to be that, it's terrifying, it's awful, it was actually God's grace to me. That police officer was not giving me the worst night of my life, he was giving me grace. So w- that we have to see God's law like that. So again, what felt like a terrible night was actually, who knows what would have happened in the next mile. Who knows if I'd made a habit out of speeding as a 16-year-old knucklehead? What could have happened? I could have hurt myself and others. And the law protected me, even though it hurt in the moment. We have to see God's way, God's way, God's pathway, God's law in that way. God calls things sin because he wants the best for you. He's creating a pathway for us. And so John says in verses 15 to 17 of 1 John 2, don't love the world. I'm talking about loving first this weekend. Don't love the world, he says, it's always going to let you down. Everything that is promising you, pride and greed and self-centeredness, it's never going to deliver. All that's passing away. But obeying God and living in his way will never perish. And we're like, great, now what? Okay, I want to love first. Uh, I want freedom. I, I want to, you know, go away from the world's way and align my life with God's way all the more. But as the great Ricky Bobby said, like, but the, what do I do with my hands? What's next? What do I do? Great, I'm in, I'm inspired. Now what? Jesus said he's the way, okay? Jesus doesn't just offer inspiration, but a pathway, an actual way. He told his disciples, follow me, and he meant that. Like, do what I do. Walk where I walk, say what I say, react, act like I'm acting and reacting. Our church, we walked through the book of Acts last year, and that word way is everywhere in Acts. Increasingly so, the word grows and actually becomes a label for the whole gospel of Jesus. Christians were even, they even started to be called people of the way, okay? And so a way suggests a journey of transformation, right? With steps of maturity, both individually and corporately. So when Jesus was making disciples, he didn't just take some guys to a lecture hall and show them a great PowerPoint. Okay, that's not what he did. Uh, It wasn't just a matter of acquiring knowledge. He taught them how to love. Now, right thinking, deep study, uh, striving to know right doctrine is essential. Okay, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater here. We don't forsake knowledge. A follower of Jesus is eager to be a student of the Word. If you cut us at our church, we believe the Bible. We love God's Word. Psalm 1-2 says we delight in the law of the Lord. That's fantastic, okay? But in our tradition, and I've been a Baptist my whole life, okay, in our tradition, we prioritize knowing over practicing, We prioritize sitting over actually training and practicing the things of God. The Bible talks quite a lot about putting these things to action. You all know James 1.22 says to not just be hearers of the word, go ahead and be doers of the word. Do you ever experience a gap uh, between new knowledge and information and what you seem to do the next day? Not just me, that's good. Maybe you've noticed there's kind of a gap there. This is abundantly clear this time of year for us Cowboys fans, and I'm a true one. It hurts. I'm going to watch the game tomorrow, but I'm not happy about it, okay? Uh, You know, I remember when the schedule was was released last May or so. They released the NFL schedule, and I'm pouring over it, and I'm saying crazy things like, if we can squeak out two wins in November, this is is it. We're going to be sitting pretty. I believed... That this was the year. I can make a case that next year, new, new defensive coordinator, anyway, I, I can make a case, okay? But we, the information at hand might have led us to believe that we were not going to break the three-decade cycle of a great season followed by an early playoff loss. Okay. But the, so the information didn't lead to some kind of change in the way that we approached the season as fans. And so... I, so I, I get, so I experience, we all experience, like, I really want to be like Christ. I really want to, I'm showing up at conferences, I'm coming to church, I want to be like Jesus. Yet all the knowledge that I'm accruing doesn't always translate to my way of life. It's almost like we can't think our way to holiness. 
you know? Uh, what if that's because you aren't just a thinking thing? Uh, what if our understanding and approach to discipleship has been just, just a hair off? Descartes, we all remember, he said, I think, therefore I am. And I think that's really influenced the way that we think about discipleship. In his amazing must-read book, You Are What You Love, James K.A. Smith proposes, <coughs> excuse me, that we are not primarily thinking things, but we are first and foremost loving things. Uh, and we each have to teach our hearts what to love. And again, great, I'm for you. Now, what, what do we do with our hands? What's next? If knowing information about God is great but not enough, what's the process here? How do we develop our loves and actually change to mature in Christ? The first part of verse 5 is interesting, okay? He says, whoever keeps his word... In him, truly, the love of God is, what's that word, perfected. Now, the love of God is perfect no matter how we respond to it, right? So, so what is he talking about? Look at 1 John chapter 4, verse 12. Whoever's preaching this uh, chapter, I'm so sorry. I'm not going to spend long here, okay? But 1 John 4, 12, just flip one page. John says, no one's ever seen God. God the Father, nobody's ever seen him face to face. They've seen a burning bush and different things, but nobody's ever seen God the Father face to face. But if we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. In other words, nobody's ever seen God, but when we treat each other like Jesus wants us to, they kind of do. God's love is perfected in us. That's what he says in verse 5. So how do we see God's love perfected in us individually and as a church? First way is to increase your Bible study. If you want to write, write this down. Oh, it's up there. Good. Increase your Bible study with an eye toward obedience. And wherever you are in the journey with Christ, you never read the Bible to I read it every day. You can increase your Bible study with an eye toward obedience. How will we keep his word if we're not devoted to it? Okay, we have to meditate on it day and night. The Bible is the primary way that God speaks to us today. And it's essential to, for us to walk in the same way as Jesus walked, as John says in verse 6. So let me first encourage you. Those of you who have very little experience with the Bible, it's a really complicated book, <laughs> okay? Uh, the first time you read it, you know, you, you might have more questions than answers. That's okay. Keep going, okay? Think of something you're really good at. I think of my buddy, Pastor Bo, okay? He, he, you know, he's actually a really good golfer. Did y'all know that? Okay. Uh, uh, Bo, did you, so the first time you played golf, your first hole, did you birdie your first hole? No, but he birdies a lot of them now, okay? <laughs> he's in. He birdies some of them now, okay? So that comes with anything that you're good at. It takes time and practice. You're not good the very first time you do it. So if you read a chapter of the Bible and you don't know what in the world is going on, that's okay. Read it again and again and again. And, and the, your first time through the Bible, it's, it's going to be pretty fuzzy. The second time, you're going to kind of have a grip on it. By that third time, you're going to kind of know what's going on. Keep going. We overestimate what we can do in one year and underestimate what we can do in five years. Keep going. Study the Bible. Increase your Bible study with an eye toward obedience. Every day when I read the scriptures, I use, so y'all are giving out the CSB scripture journal. That's what I use for my personal Bible study every day. And they travel really well too. So whichever book I'm going through, I'll read two or three chapters depending on where I am in the scriptures, cup of coffee, pen, and my scripture journal. And I'll just study two or three chapters, right? And I make notes. I write out questions. And every day I try to write out one truth from that text that I can live out that day. Every day. One truth, what's one thing that I can live out today? So let's say 1 John 2 was something that I was, uh, let's say that was my quiet time today. And I read in verses 15 to 17, don't love the world, leave any love of the world behind. So maybe my application that day would be like, you know what, today I'm not going to get on social media at all. It's not all bad, it's not all good, but it's, it's not all bad. But you know, today sometimes it leads me to love the world more than I should, so I'm just not even going to look at social media today. Something like that. Every single day, as you're reading the text, as you're studying the Bible, every sermon you, every sermon you listen to, before you listen to the sermon, before you engage with your class or your Bible, whatever your small groups look like here, before you engage in another Bible study, you stop and you pray, God, show me today how I can be more like you. Give me a new practice. Give me a new action today that I can step toward with an eye toward obedience. And, you know, um, in, in my church, we're reaching a lot of new Christians. A lot of, you know, most of our church, they were not believers before they came to our church. And so, you know, a lot of people give us the feedback, like, I don't even read, much less read an ancient document. Okay, well, listen to the Bible. 
Maybe you study the Bible every day. A new, a new practice can be listening, or maybe you never study the Bible. Your first step can be listening to the Bible. The Bible app has a great option. The Dwell app, if there's a monthly fee, but it's fantastic, okay? Did you know that in 1820, 200 years ago, only 12% of the world could read? So more Christians have listened to the Bible than read it in our history, and so it's not a sin to, to listen to the Bible. It's all good, okay? So just... Find new ways to have more intake of the scriptures in your heart and life. New ways, new practices to get more of God's word into your life with an eye toward obedience. Um, If you read sporadically, maybe you read the Bible six days a week. Maybe this week you read it every day. Next week you won't touch it. We can be that way. Well, the Bible really was more designed uh, as kind of a daily bread than gorging on it for a couple days and living off that for a month. So, what is a daily habit that you can get into? You know, is there a 30-minute daily break at work to, that you could use as your Bible time? Is there a 15-minute time where the baby takes a nap, and that's when you can use as your Bible time? Do you have a commute where you can listen to the Word every day? This is a crazy idea, because you get up 30 minutes earlier. One of my mentors uh, always, you know, as, when I, back when I was young, uh, he used to always say, Jesus was a morning person. Yeah, I hated it too. And but he what he he is. So you know we need daily Bible study. We need weekly sermons. We need weekly group studies. We need a lot of the Bible. Okay, I, I know my heart. At least I'm trying to get to know it. And I need a lot of the Bible. I need a lot of reminders. Uh, when my I have one wife, three kids. Uh, my oldest daughter, when she was like four or five, she was on a playground just playing, mind her own business, being a sweet little baby angel. And then this mean spirited child saunters up to her and says, stupid, stupid, you're stupid. And without missing a beat, my little girl goes, I'm not stupid, I'm Taylor Grace. (laughs) How's she able to do that? Every night when I put my kids to bed, I say three things to them. Every night, I love you, I'm proud of you, and you're my girl forever. I love you. I'm proud of you, and you're forever, you're my boy, you're my girl. And so she's met with the hater, The mean-spirited child tries to tell her who she is, and she doesn't receive it because every night she looks in my eyes, and I tell her who she is. I love you. Your dad, no matter what happens, I'm with you. I'm for you. We're together forever. And so we need that from Jesus every day. We need for him to look us in the eyes and go, no, you can't earn your salvation. You You can't keep your salvation with your good works. I got you. I love you. Keep going. We need that in church, small groups, and alone every day. Okay, two, two more things as we, uh, you know, as we continue. And I'm going to put these together, okay? Serve others inside the church and serve others outside the church. So very simple ideas as we think about how to love first. So what are two new practices? I mean, what's a new, practices, a new practice as you're making notes to serve somebody inside the church and to serve somebody outside the church? Again, it's a pretty simple thing that John is teaching us right? To to not love the world and to love Jesus more, okay? And so how can we practice that? As you're making notes, try to come up with an idea of implementation in your own life. If you, you probably have found by this point that the more that your world is about you, the kind of more angry and tired you'll be. And the more that your world is about others, the more kind of free you feel. That's what Jesus is trying to give you in your life. And so get specific. What is a regular practice where you can serve others and receive Nothing in return. What, how can you regularly choose the lowest place, as Jesus said in Luke? So outside of the church, I'm, and so I, I, even as I walked in today, y'all have so many local mission things that y'all are doing. It's really inspiring and awesome. So join in one of those things. At my church, we're serving in the food bank, and we started a English as a second language program. There was a young girl in our church last year. She had an interaction at a Walmart with a lady who moved to our country and can't speak English, and this young college girl, she was telling me about it, and she goes, imagine how lonely that is. You know, they make it to our awesome country, this, the, the land of freedom, the land of opportunity, and then she can't even read the road signs and doesn't know who to ask. That's how Jesus would react to somebody who doesn't speak English, I think, in our country. And so she goes, I wonder what we could do. And so she wrote a curriculum and did all these things and has recruited volunteers in our church. Every Tuesday and Thursday night, we teach people how to speak English, right? And so what does it look like in your life? What's a practice? Uh, that you can serve someone outside the church. Um, my family, uh, in this, you know, uh, it's not rocket science. 
You know, a lot of times, so my family, the first Monday of every month, we bake and take cookies to a neighbor on our street. We only have like seven people on our street. So by the end of the year, about two times, we've taken cookies to our neighbors. And, you know, our kids end up sneaking a cookie. They love, they love this practice, right? And we, we just find a way to serve our neighbors. What does it look like in your neighborhood, on your street, in your life, within your church? You can join something that's already happening in your church or start something like that or both. Inside your church, I guarantee you that your kids' ministry needs more volunteers. I haven't talked to Pastor Bo about it, but I'm going to go and guarantee you that you could jump in on that. And so parking teams, safety teams, all those kinds of things. And so, again, instead of just going, yeah, I'm going to serve people more. I'm going to love first. How? What's the new practice to increase love in your life? Practice makes perfect. Any coach ever tell you that when you were a kid? It it actually ends up being true. Practice makes perfect. So if you want to love like Jesus, that's a marathon that requires quite a bit of training. And so, you know, much like doing one sit-up won't get us beach ready for spring break. Okay, it takes more than that. Okay. Um, you know, serving one person one time won't melt all the, the pride and self-centeredness away from my heart, right? But daily, weekly practices become formative. And so, again, wherever you are on the journey with Christ, you can increase. What's another way you can serve inside and outside? So, again, practice makes perfect. So, if we practice loving worldly things, we end up getting good at it, right? If we practice Jesus' pathway, our uh, our love grows. You know, Judas, his betrayal of Jesus wasn't spontaneous. Right? He had been practicing greed. He was the one that kept their money back. And so instead of having like a, a ministry account and a debit card like we do now, Judas kept the disciples' money back. That way, when they went from city to city, they could buy food and supplies as they needed. So Judas had kind of been sneaking some money all along. He practiced greed for quite a while, and then when it came time, he pra- after practicing greed over and over, he sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, right? And so, it, so him selling Jesus out was actually the culmination of a pattern in his life. He had been practicing, he had gotten good at greed. And it's a sobering reminder. The death that results from sin isn't always visible at first. You know, very often the thing that first dies is our conviction about it. And so as we change our schedules and as we change our routines, we practice Jesus' way. So one of the things that I tell my kids is we don't say can't. Can't isn't a Kendrick word. I bet I've said it 10,000 times. Hey, buddy, can you grab that for me? No, I can't. We don't say can't. Okay. So uh, last fall or so, me and my oldest son, he's a, he's a football, he loves playing football. And so we were outside, and I was quarterback, and he was running routes. We were practicing. And so then he has the idea, I need to run routes, and he throws to me. And I go, I'll let it slip. Oh, buddy, I can't do that. Dad, we don't say can't. So I began to run routes, and quite a lot of them, uh, if I'm honest with you. And the next day, everything was sore. I mean, ankles, knees. I felt every route. So in my 2024 goals, one of my 2024 goals is to be physically able to play peewee flag football. And I knew that you would all heartlessly laugh at that. I knew that was coming. But I have to train. So I've been stretching. I've been working on my... I'm about to turn 40, though. Okay, i got to work on my agility, okay? And so if today, if you were, you know, if you were to go, you know, I haven't run since 2013, but enough's enough. I'm going to run a marathon tomorrow. So it's more than just a matter of the will. Like, your lungs are going to give out. <laughs> your body's not ready for that marathon. So... Uh, as we talk about God's love being perfected in us, we don't just go, that's it. I'm never going to be prideful for even a second the rest of my life. That may not be a marathon that you're exactly ready for. So serving each other within the church and serving people outside the church, it's a marath- so it's a marathon. And as we get ready, we train, we practice. Practice makes perfect. Somebody asked me recently how our church is growing, you know, which is it's a miracle to me. And honestly, I think the reason we're growing is... We are serving the heck out of Fort Worth. I was at a, brec- like a community breakfast a couple of weeks ago, and the principals at West Park Elementary and Benbrook Elementary found me, and they go, your church is awesome. I was like, I know. Why? You know, tell me everything. And it's like, it's not anything I'm doing. It's parents and volunteers of our church that are just getting after it. They're, they're chairpersons of the PTA, and they're taking donuts to teachers and all these things. They're living out what the gospel describes. We have a teenager in our church, Micah, the kid's a grinder, and 
so I was meeting with him and his dad. He's 16 years old, and he started a lawn, a lawn business last summer. He wanted to make some extra money, take some girls on dates, honestly, is why he wanted to do it. So he started a lawn business, and so his dad, as, he was, as his son was getting this going, he goes, hey, son, Micah, as you get this going, hard work, that's great. Also figure out how you can bless people in, in Jesus' name with it, okay, kind of living out as we're talking today. And so his dad, he said, hey, tell Pastor Matt kind of what you've been doing. And Micah goes, well, I've been, uh, you know, cutting a few widow's lawns for free. I go, Micah, that's awesome. How did you find the widows? And he goes, I look for tall grass. <laughs> it's not rocket science. If you look for needs to meet and people to serve, you'll find them. And I think that as you do that, you know, everybody who goes on a mission trip comes back with the same feedback. I went there to bless them, but they blessed me. What are they saying? I thought that going to Guatemala and getting my fingernails in the dirt, that that was really going to help the people. But actually, as I lived in Jesus' way, I felt free. I felt good about it, right? And so, and I just believe that as we embody Jesus' character and serve others, that our church will grow. And as we take the lowly position of service in our city, people will be drawn in. And you know why? Because Jesus is awesome. You know? And if we'll just kind of act like Jesus, more peace will invade our hearts and more people in our city will want to know Jesus. So as we study the life of Jesus, you really don't go far without seeing him serve somebody. So as we live that out and serve others, as we embody uh, the way of serving others like Jesus, we end up changing, right? So who can you serve outside these, the, these walls this week? Who can you serve inside these walls this week? What regular practice can you add to your life so that love has the chance to grow? And as we are primarily loving things, not thinking things, how can you let love grow in your heart? Um, we change by changing, right? And so, in conclusion, uh, studies show that 55% of listeners re-engage when they hear the words in conclusion. So, in conclusion, <laughs> conclusion, conclusion. Um, running from the world's way and to Jesus is something you'll never regret. The world is offering you death. It's got really shiny packaging. But that's really what they're offering is death. And Jesus is offering you life. And Jesus loves you enough to demand obedience. Um, and let me say something so it's explicit. We're not talking about earning salvation today. That's not the idea. The Bible is crystal clear that it's only hope if it's in Jesus. It's not hope if my salvation comes down to how good I am or how hard I pray or if I serve widows or whatever else it is. If my hope is in me or in my performance, I'm sunk, okay? Okay. But praise God, my salvation is secured in Jesus. So we're not talking about earning or keeping your salvation. We're talking about once you're in Christ, the freedom that is before you by diving more deeply into his word every single day, by serving people within our church, by serving people outside of our church so that love grows within our heart and we don't just want to be loving people, but we actually practice it so that we become the people that Jesus wants us to be. Uh, okay, so let me pray for us. And are you coming up next? Yeah. Okay, let me pray for you guys. God, thank you so much for First Baptist Justin. What an honor it is to be in this place where for over 100 years disciples have been made, the gospel has been proclaimed, missionaries sent out. And God, we, we want to actually ask for more, that you would do more of that. That you would save people that right now in Justin, Texas, aren't even thinking about you. That you would, uh, that would, they would see baptisms and more churches started. God, thank you for Pastor Bo. I pray that as he continues to lead this great church, that you would bless him. You would give him uh, great kindness and favor. And God, now as we think about how to live in uh, the, the teachings of your word, show us a new way to increase our Bible study with an eye toward obedience. Show us ways that we could serve others outside the church and inside the church so that your love grows both in our hearts and around this city. In Jesus' name, amen.